Well, as you know, we are studying the life of Martin Luther, his uh, life and his example. And it, we haven't actually uh, been here for a little while. It's uh, been since 2003, as I mentioned this morning. But actually, what Martin Luther did or what the Lord did through him is what we celebrate uh, every Reformation Day. That is, um, the day in which he nailed the 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg, which is usually seen as the beginning of the Reformation. Certainly the Lord um, did begin a work at that time, but as we're going to see this evening, uh, at least hopefully, uh, Luther at that time himself was not yet converted. He hadn't discovered the gospel. However, once he did, he, um, the Lord began to show him more and more, and uh, more and more reforms took place in the church and the Reformation as we uh, know it uh, took place. Now, we need to understand a little bit about the church in Luther's time in order to appreciate what it is that um, uh, he had to do. Uh, the history of the church is basically the story of her rising and falling and rising again. It's almost like a roller coaster. It's very similar to our Christian life. Uh, sometimes we're on a mountaintop, sometimes we go down into the valleys, uh, there is a rising and a falling. And what I mean by that is, oops, let's see, okay, during the time of the apostles, uh, we did have a very good view, the church had a good view, they were well grounded in the truth, but after the um, apostles died off, uh, the church basically plunged into darkness. And the history of the church is really a struggle to regain the truth, or at least to get back to where we were before we fell into the situation we were in. And we might say that um, we really didn't fully recover until the Reformation took place. I mean, we lost what was most precious to the church, and that was the gospel. Let me just say quickly something about why the church actually fell as she did into darkness. And it's mainly because that as the church continued to expand, as it continued to evangelize, it had a um, sort of a bad practice of absorbing into its thoughts or into its ideas uh, those ideas it came in contact with in those uh, cultures. And it didn't really do a good job of scrutinizing the things that other people believed by the word. They tried to make Christianity more palatable by... Uh, blending it with those cultures and ideas that they already uh, had. So as a result, the church embraced a great deal of false teaching. Um, some things, that actually everything that it embraced that wasn't biblical was harmful to the church, but some things that she embraced actually were quite destructive. Now, by Luther's day, this included a number of things um, this one, first one, is not quite so destructive, although it is in error, and that is the celibacy of the clergy. It was believed that uh, if a man was to uh, be set aside as a minister of the Word of God, he should not get married. But sadly, the result of that was immorality among the clergy who didn't have the gift of singleness. Also, the practice of withholding God's Word from God's people because they were afraid, at least on the best view, that they might interpret, misinterpret it. Services were held in Latin. The church was basically looked at as an infallible interpreter of the word, which the people of God simply needed to accept. And this kept the people bound in ignorance and bound to the church as the infallible interpreter of the truth, mediators of the truth. Of course, the veneration of Mary and of the saints also uh, sprung up during that time frame. You couldn't really come directly to the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be accepted by God. You had to come through a mediator to get to Christ, and those mediators took various forms. Mary was the main one because they thought that Jesus would be most likely to listen to her because she was his mother. Uh, the saints also might be able to help since they were in the Lord's favor. And, of course, the whole priesthood and, and the uh, sacraments and so forth was one grand system of mediation between us and God rather than simply the Lord Jesus Christ. But the office of the Pope also popped up during that time. And, as you know, the Pope calls himself the Vicar of Christ. 
on earth, the one who literally takes Christ's place on earth as the head of his church, the one who literally, when he speaks in his office as the Pope on matters that have to do with what the Bible teaches, either in doctrine or morals, what he says is infallible. He is the pastor and the teacher of all Christendom, and they believe it's necessary for him to be infallible in order to do that. They also believed in purgatory, the idea that this was a necessary step in order to get to heaven uh, in this world uh, if, if we receive the grace of God through the sacraments in their view. Uh, our guilt can be removed, but there's still some punishment that is due for us for our sins. We might call it temporal punishment that we never uh, fully satisfy in this life, and so we have to suffer for it. We have to make satisfaction for it in a place called purgatory. And actually, this is going to be very important because when Tetzel comes selling indulgences, those indulgences were meant, or at least he was marketing them as something that could make you avoid purgatory and something that could be sold that would allow, um, well, actually allow you to buy a loved one out of purgatory in order to get to heaven. Uh, this was one of the two main causes, actually, uh, indulgences of the Reformation. Uh, the belief in transubstantiation, the miracle in the uh, Lord's Supper after the consecration of the priest, uh, after he gives the words of consecration, the substance of the bread and wine are miraculously transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And um, even though they still appear outwardly as bread and wine, and the people of God actually worship the bread and the wine, which amounts to idolatry. But most seriously is their belief that the priesthood and the sacraments were necessary for salvation. Man was not saved by grace alone through faith alone, but grace ministered through a duly consecrated priest, one as we saw this morning who is in succession to Peter, that um, must minister the sacraments Grace is deposited in the sacraments, and the faithful, when they receive the sacraments, receive that grace. Uh, initially in baptism, which in a certain sense regenerates you, and then is fed through the Lord's Supper and various other sacraments, uh, depending upon where you are in life and what your vocation happens to be. Now, that we call sacerdotalism, uh, salvation that comes through the priesthood. Sacerdos means priest. Uh, we are evangelicals. We believe that the grace of God comes through the gospel. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel, and we are saved. We don't need a priest, at least any other priest, than the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, what they did was they separated uh, man from God with this layer of works. You have to come to the priest. You have to receive the sacraments. And if you do, you receive grace. Now let's take a look at some of the early attempts to reform the church, and this is basically a bit of review to give us a running start towards Luther and what the Lord does to reform the church in his day. Uh, we do need to realize that reform did not begin with Martin Luther, nor was it limited to uh, these particular men and their movements, Peter Waldo, uh, let's see the second one there I think is Huss, and then Wycliffe. First, we have uh, Peter Waldo, who founded a movement in 1170. It was called the Waldenses. Uh, they had a variety of good beliefs. First of all, they rejected the teaching of the church that day. Uh, they didn't accept the Pope as the head of the church, but rather saw him as the Antichrist. They objected to relics, to images of the saints, uh, to the mass or transubstantiation. Basically, they have a whole list of things they rejected. Special rites, burial and holy ground, indulgences, which we're going to look at in a bit, purgatory, as we've already seen, absolution, uh, the declaration of forgiveness by a priest, uh, justification by works, which is what they saw the whole Roman system to be. You've got to live up to a particular standard. You need to do these particular things in order to be saved. They rejected the idea of regeneration through baptism, again, as a part of the sacramental system uh, 
of the church of that day. And uh, they objected to the immorality and gluttony among the clergy. We talked about the celibacy of the clergy. Uh, with not being able to marry, they had desires, and they typically turned to immorality, as well as um, gluttony. They liked to use their office to their own advantage. Instead, the followers of um, Peter Waldo embraced the teaching of the New Testament, supported the translation of the Bible into the common language, preached in the common tongue, evangelized two by two, according to the example Christ gave, advocated obedience to the gospel, especially the Sermon on the Mount, which um, we would say, we may not want to say that we want to single that out, but it certainly is very important. And they preached, most importantly, justification by the merits of Christ alone. Then there was John Wycliffe, who lived from 1328 to 1384, who was a Christian scholar at Oxford University. Uh, in his day, he rejected also the office of the Pope. He rejected transubstantiation. He questioned purgatory, other teachings of the church. He believed that the scriptures contained the whole of God's revelation as opposed to the traditions that had been building up within the church. You need to remember the church at that time. And by the way, the Roman church today still believes that there are three sources of revelation. There is the Bible, there is tradition, and then there is continuing revelation through the office of the Pope as he continues to exercise his office as teacher, an infallible teacher, again, in, in the area of uh, doctrine and morals. He believed everything must be tested by the Scripture, that it should be translated into the language of the people. As you know, Wycliffe uh, did a New Testament translation. He believed preaching should be in the common tongue, and he founded a group of lay preachers called Lollards. And again, they continued their ministry after Wycliffe was um, taken to heaven by God. And then there was John Huss, who basically was a Bohemian priest and lecturer at the University of Prague, and there are his dates. Uh, he was influenced by disciples of Wycliffe who copied Wycliffe's writings and brought them back to Bohemia. And there he also sought to reform the church. He rejected Latin and preached it in the language of the people. He accepted the Bible as the ultimate authority. He declared Christ to be the head of the church, not the Pope. He believed that the elect were the church of Christ. One of the interesting beliefs uh, in the uh, church of that day and in the Roman church today is that the church is not the body of believers. The church is, is the Pope the cardinal and the bishops, but not the people of God, which is uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting view. But he believed it was everyone who trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, most importantly, he believed that forgiveness of sins came through Christ alone. Uh, Huss, by the way, paid the ultimate price for uh, his convictions. He was declared a heretic and he was burned at the stake. Now that brings us to, uh, to Martin Luther, uh, 1483 to 1546. Let's take, first of all, just a couple of notes about his early life. He was born um, November the 10th, 1483 in Eisleben. And on the picture on the left there is, is a picture of that town. The picture on the right is actually supposed to be the house in which he was born. I guess they, uh, they don't build them like that anymore, um, uh, houses that last that long. After um, a short time of schooling with the uh, Brethren of the Common Life in Magdeburg, uh, he was sent to a school in Eisenach between 1498 and 1501 where he was taught uh, the Latin that he needed to know to go on to university study. In uh, 1501, he went to the University of Erfurt where he studied uh, Aristotle. Let's see. There he learned that uh, revelation was to be his guide in faith, but reason uh, in philosophy. Although we, I think we would say, and I'm sure Luther would agree with us, the true philosophy is also contained in Scripture. But here he also became aware of the need of God's intervention in order to learn spiritual truth, in order to be saved. Although apparently he didn't. Uh, have that intervention at that time. In 1502 or 1503, he received his Bachelor of Arts. In 1505, he received his 
master of arts. Then he entered into the monastery. Now, his father wanted him to study law, but in 1505, after being frightened in a thunderstorm, he promised Saint Anne that if she would spare his life or that if his life was spared, that he would become a monk. Basically, this reflected a concern that he already had for his soul. He didn't want to go into the law. He wanted to go into the monastery because in those days, a person who was concerned about his soul, that is where you would go. You would give up all your worldly possessions. You would give up uh, the world totally. You would give up the idea of ever being married, and you would go into the monastery just to seek the Lord for your salvation. They believed it was a very difficult thing, and he was committed to finding the Lord. So two weeks later, he entered a monastery of the Augustinian order, which is what that picture is up there, the Augustinian uh, monastery that he entered. In 1507, he was ordained a priest and celebrated his first Mass. It was during this time that he sought for that peace through abstinence, penance, self-flagellation, which means basically self-whipping. But he didn't find peace. Again, this was the direction they pointed him to find peace with God. But what is this except a series of works? In 1508, he went to the University of Wittenberg and taught theology for uh, one semester. His studies uh, there only intensified his uh, spiritual struggles. Uh, Staupitz, who was the, uh, the head or the vicar of that particular order, urged him to trust God and to study the Bible. Uh, Staupitz actually sent him to Rome during the winter of 1510 and 1511. Uh, here, he, well, basically didn't help his faith, but um, he saw even more of the corruption of the Roman church and the need for reform. 1511, he was transferred to, to Wittenberg, where he became professor of Bible. He received his uh, Doctor of Theology degree. Uh, held his position or the position of lecturer in biblical theology uh, until his death. Uh, there he began to lecture on the Bible in the common language and study uh, the original languages. Uh, later we find that he, uh, he taught uh, on the books um, of the Bible and Psalms, the book of Psalms from 1513 to 1515, Romans from 1515 to 1517, and then later on in Galatians and Hebrews. So basically, these various influences in his life, Staupitz, uh, pictured there on your left, uh, his trip to Rome, uh, a book that I didn't mention called The German Theology, which I believe was a, uh, a book that came out of, the, uh, out of mysticism, that uh, was also an influence, the writings of the fathers, and especially that of Augustine, whom you see pictured on the right, uh, these were all uh, strong influences that uh, began to move him uh, in the right direction, but it was really the study of the Bible that uh, led him to faith. Now let's take a look at the events that began the Reformation, beginning with the 95 Theses, which um, in the past I... Um, I had understood was a document that didn't condemn uh, the use of indulgences, but rather the abuse of indulgences. But as I was reading through them this time, I, I came to understand that basically every single one of them was an argument against the use of indulgences. So basically, uh, Luther had rejected the idea altogether. Uh, I think one of his arguments basically says that if, if the Pope can dispense grace through indulgences, uh, why doesn't he just, out of pure Christian charity, out of love, just open up purgatory and let those uh, saints that are suffering there enter into heaven? Why would he sell them? Well, basically, what leads up to the 95 Theses in 1517, Tetzel uh, began selling indulgences at Uterbach near Wittenberg, where Luther was teacher. And these were, oops, let's see. <laughs> There we go. These were special plenary indulgences. 
that were being sold in order to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And actually, as you look at uh, pictures of the Vatican, that basilica is looming in the background. It's probably the largest building that is there. Uh, it was a special indulgence that was commissioned by the Pope that was plenary, which means it basically gave a full satisfaction. Uh, the idea behind it, of course, was to raise money to build the basilica, but the way it was being marketed was, by Tetzel anyway, was that he claimed that in order to receive forgiveness, and indulgences never really were for forgiveness, but they were for satisfaction for the, uh, the temporal part of the punishment, not for the guilt of the sin that sent you to hell. Well, he was claiming you could actually get full forgiveness and you didn't even need to repent. Uh, complete forgiveness of all sins and that these things could also be purchased for those who are in purgatory, uh, those who are already there. He had a slogan like most salesmen do uh, in those days to try to promote the sale of indulgences when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Well, Luther, of course, um, was not going to sit down while Tetzel was marketing such things that could destroy the souls of those to whom he was ministering. So he posted or he, he wrote in response to, these, uh, to this abuse and actually to the idea of, in, of indulgences uh, altogether, the 95 Theses, a document that contains 95 arguments against indulgences. And of course, uh, his nailing these theses to the church door in Wittenberg in October the 31st in 1517 was not really a uh, provocative move on his part, but the common way of calling for public debate. By the way, the picture up there is, is actually of the church in Wittenberg. The uh, wooden doors that he nailed the theses to have, have long since deteriorated but uh, those commemorative bronze doors that are have taken the place actually have the 95 theses engraved in them. Well, that, as I said, the 95 theses was one of the things that the Lord used to begin the Reformation. The second uh, event, you might say, was the Tower Experience, 1519. Uh, So-called Tower Experience because... Uh, this is where Luther was converted. Uh, this is actually the Augustinian monastery, um, or actually not the monastery, but this, let's see. Uh, this was called the Black Cloister. And uh, his study actually was in the, that particular tower. And it was in that tower that um, he found the Lord. I think I gave you a quote from uh, what he had wrote um, regarding that conversion this morning, but I'd like to um, go ahead and give you a little fuller sample of it now. He, he writes this in his preface to the complete edition of his Latin works. He says, Meanwhile, in that same year, 1519, I had begun interpreting the Psalms once again. I felt confident that I was now more experienced since I had dealt in university courses with St. Paul's letters to, to the Romans, to the Galatians, and the letter to the Hebrews. I had conceived a burning desire to understand what Paul meant in his letter to the Romans, but thus far there had stood in my way not the cold blood around my heart, but that one word which is in chapter 1. The justice of God is revealed in it. I hated that word, justice of God which by the use and custom of all my teachers I had been taught to understand philosophically as referring to formal or active justice as they call it, that is, that justice by which God is just and by which he punishes sinners and the unjust. But I, blameless monk that I was, felt that before God I was a sinner with an extremely troubled conscience. I couldn't be sure that God was appeased by my satisfaction I did not love, no, rather I hated the just God who punishes sinners in silence if I did not blaspheme, and certainly I grumbled vehemently and got angry at God. I said, isn't it enough that we miserable sinners lost for all eternity because of original sin are oppressed by every kind of calamity through the Ten Commandments? Why does God heap sorrow upon sorrow through the gospel? 
and through the gospel threaten us with his justice and his wrath. This was how I was raging with wild and disturbed conscience. I constantly badgered St. Paul about that spot in Romans 1 and anxiously wanted to know what he meant. I meditated night and day on those words until at last, by the mercy of God, I paid attention to their context. The justice of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. I began to understand that in this verse, the justice of God is that by which the just person lives, by a gift of God, and that is by faith. I began to understand that this verse means that the justice of God is revealed through the gospel, but it is a passive justice, that by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. All at once I felt that I had been born again and entered into paradise itself through open gates. Immediately I saw the whole of Scripture in a different light. I ran through the Scriptures from memory and found that that other terms had analogous meanings. The work of God, that is, the work or what God works in us, the power of God by which he makes us powerful, the wisdom of God by which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. So Luther's tower experience is basically that by which God in his mercy revealed to him the gospel and Luther was converted. Basically, without this, I don't think there would have been a reformation, perhaps outside of what human effort could do, but there would not be the regaining of the gospel. The next thing we move to is the debate at Leipzig, July the 4th, 1519. But before we get there, there were certain things that happened between the posting of the theses and that actual debate. Now, we already said that the posting of the theses was the common way of calling for a debate. Uh, Luther was surprised when no one accepted his challenge. The next day was called All Saints Day. That's when the people came to see the relics that Frederick, uh, the elector of Saxony, the, basically the ruler of that province, um, had collected in the church. There were over 5,000. And when they came, they also saw the theses posted on the door. Now, the theses were written in Latin, which means it was calling for a public debate among the teachers of the church and not among the, the, uh, the common people who would not be able to understand it. Now, some of the people who came could read it, but others couldn't. Those who could copied it down, translated it, and began to print it in several languages. Within two weeks, the theses were known throughout Germany. Within four weeks, they had been read all over Western Europe. Uh, the remark, or I should say the effect, of the theses was uh, quite profound. Uh, it almost entirely put a stop to the sale of indulgences, uh, which, as you might imagine, uh, created no little concern for those who were selling them. So reaction of the church to the theses, uh, the Archbishop of Mainz, objected because he had been receiving a percentage of the proceeds. Uh, uh, basically, uh, those who had ecclesiastical control of the area always got a cut of the, uh, the pie, as it were, when things of this nature were done in their province. So he sent a copy of the theses to Pope Leo X in Rome, who at first didn't think that uh, these things were too serious, but then sent word to Staupitz to uh, quiet him down. Tetzel began to write some theses of his own uh, defending the sale of indulgences. A uh, Dominican monk and inquisitor in Rome by the name of Mazzolini wrote a book severely criticizing Luther. And uh, John Eck wrote uh, a pamphlet answering uh, Luther's theses. John Eck was professor of theology at Ingolstadt. Uh, Luther answered uh, or published his answer to X uh, pamphlet in another pamphlet. Uh, Luther was um, disappointed that his friends didn't come alongside and defend him uh, because they believed that he had been too rash in his uh, criticisms. Let's see, am I missing something here? Okay. In April of 1518, the Augustinian monasteries held their annual meeting.
in uh, Heidelberg where Luther found that his, the opposition to his theses was much stronger than he expected. But the discussion that took place there was basically friendly as, as well as frank and uh, put him at ease. When he returned to Wittenberg, he wrote his resolutions and addressed them to the Pope. It contained a general reply to all his critics, carefully defending the theses point by point. Now, further developments. After um, Luther wrote his resolutions, he began to feel as though he lived in a glass house because he actually did. Everything that he said and did was basically watched by friends and foes alike. Uh, many things that he said were exaggerated and used uh, against him. Uh, the Pope summoned him to Rome, July of 1518, on a charge of heresy, but Frederick was able to have the summons uh, canceled. Uh, next, uh, Cajetan, who was a delegate of the Pope, came to interview Luther at Augsburg. When Luther failed to recant then um, Cajetan wrote to the Pope asking that he might settle uh, the matter with an official pronouncement, which he did. Uh, Luther could no longer claim then that the church had not dealt with the matter. Now later the Pope sent a man by the name of von Miltitz to arrest Luther, but after discussing this with Luther, Luther promised that he wouldn't speak any further or write any further about indulgences as long as his opponents didn't. He agreed to write a letter of submission to the Pope, which he did, and the Pope liked it uh, so well that he sent Luther a friendly letter in return calling Luther uh, his dear son and inviting him to come to Rome to make his confession offering uh, to pay his way. Now, that probably would have been an end of it at that point, except Luther's opponents continued to write. Uh, one of Luther's fellow professors at, Witt at Wittenberg, uh, Andreas Karlstadt, who's pictured there on the right, also wrote a set of theses against Eck. And Eck answered Karlstadt's Theses with some of his own in which he advanced an extreme view of papal authority. Of course, Luther wasn't going to leave that unanswered, so he responded with some theses of his own, uh, publishing these 12 theses, um, the uh, 12th of which says this, that the claim of the Roman church to supremacy over all other churches rested only on, a weak, pap on, on weak papal decrees of the last 400 years, but that in all the 1,100 years before, no such supremacy had existed. Well, those are fighting words. An attack like this had never been heard before, and Eck could not ignore it, so he challenged Luther to debate the issue. Now, what Luther had cherished from his childhood up the supremacy of the Pope, that the church is the Pope's house, that the Pope is the father of the house, uh, was now that which was at issue. And so Luther studied. He studied church history. He studied the decrees and the decisions of the former popes and the general councils for nine months, trying to find arguments uh, that what, well, against what he had re uh, until recently believed to be the truth uh, what he found here, Luther was dismayed to find that many decretals were forgeries. Now here is another pillar of the church that was falling before his eyes. Now we get to Leipzig, July the 4th, 1519. Uh, the debate, uh, first of all, began between Karlstadt and Eck on his uh, own theses. But Eck really wanted to get to the meat of the matter. He wanted to debate Luther, especially on the office of the Pope. So when the time came, they began to debate that. Now what I'd like to do is uh, give you a few things that Daubigny says. Uh, if you've never read Daubigny's History of the Reformation, uh, he takes historic fact of the situation. He takes uh, I'm not sure exactly how exa he gets the dialogue, but perhaps he formulates it from either what is recorded or what he knows of, of both uh, sides. Uh, 
and does it in dialogue form. So um, basically, Daubigny writes this, that Luther was prepared to acknowledge the Pope as the head magistrate of the church, elected freely to it by the people, but he denied that he was such by divine right. The steps were taken at this debate for Luther finally to deny submission to the Pope in any sense uh, later in life. Now here's what uh, we read in, in Daubigny. He writes, Eck had no idea that his opponent's learning was so extensive and that he would be able to extricate himself from the arguments that were drawn around him. The reverend doctor said, he has come well armed in the lists. I beg your lordships to excuse me if I do not exhibit such accuracy of research. I came here to discuss and not to make a book. Eck was surprised but not beaten. It's, it looks to me like a tactic that one might use who's not prepared to answer the question. Try to turn it around on your opponent. As he had no more arguments to adduce, he had a recourse to a wretched and spiteful trick, which, if it did not vanquish his antagonist, must at least embarrass him greatly. If the accusation of being Bohemian, a heretic, a Hussite, can be fixed upon Luther, he is vanquished. For the Bohemians were objects of abhorrence in the church. From the earliest times, all good Christians have acknowledged that the Church of Rome derives its primacy direct from Christ himself and not from human right. I must confess, however, that the Bohemians, while they obstinately defended their errors, attacked this doctrine. I beg the worthy father's pardon if I am an enemy of the Bohemians, because they are enemies of the church. And if the present discussion has called these heretics to my recollection, for in my humble opinion, the doctor's conclusions are in every way favorable to these errors, it is even asserted that the Hussites are loudly boasting of it. Luther responds, I do not like and I never shall like a schism, since on their own authority the Bohemians have separated from our unity. They have done wrong, even if the divine right had pronounced in favor of their doctrines. For the supreme divine right is charity and oneness of mind. It was during the morning sitting of the 5th of July that Luther had made use of this language. The meeting broke up shortly after, as it was the hour of dinner. Luther felt ill at ease. Had he gone too far in thus condemning the Christians of Bohemia? Did they not hold the doctrines that Luther is now maintaining? He saw all the difficulties of his position. Shall he rise up against the council that condemned John Huss? Or shall he deny that sublime idea of a universal Christian church which had taken full possession of his mind? The unshaken Luther did not hesitate. He will do his duty, whatever may be the consequences. Accordingly, when the assembly met again at two in the afternoon, he was the first to speak. He said with firmness, among the articles of faith held by John Huss and the Bohemians, there are some that are most Christian. This is a positive certainty. Here, for instance, is one, that there is but one universal church. And here is another. It is not necessary for salvation to believe the Roman church superior to all others. It is of little consequence to me whether these things were said by Wycliffe or by Huss. They are truth. Luther's declaration produced a great sensation among his hearers. Huss, Wycliffe, those odious names pronounced with approbation by a monk in the midst of a Catholic assembly. An almost general murmur ran around the hall. Duke George himself felt alarmed. He fancied he saw that banner of civil war upraised in Saxony, which had for so many years desolated the states of his maternal ancestors. Unable to suppress his emotion, he placed his hands on his hips, shook his head, and exclaimed aloud so that all the assembly heard him, he is carried away by rage. The whole meeting was agitated. They rose up, each man speaking to his neighbor. Those who had given way to drowsiness awoke. Luther's friends were in great perplexity, while his enemies exulted. Many who had thus far listened to him with pleasure began to entertain doubts of his orthodoxy. The impression produced on Duke George's mind by these words was never effaced. From this moment, he looked upon the reformer with an evil eye and became his enemy. The subject of the discussion furnished matter for conversation in every place. In the inns, the university, and the court, each man expressed his opinion 
However great might have been Duke George's exasperation, he did not obstinately refuse to be convinced. One day as Eck and Luther were dining with him, he interrupted their conversation by saying, whether the Pope be Pope by human or divine right, nevertheless, he is Pope. Luther was much pleased at these words. The prince, said he, would never have made use of them had he not been struck by my arguments. The discussion on the papal primacy had lasted five days. On the 8th of July, they proceeded to the doctrine of purgatory. This spread over a little more than two days. Luther still admitted this doctrine, but denied that it was taught in Scripture or in the Fathers in the manner that his opponents and the schoolmen pretended. Our Dr. Eck, said he, alluded to the superficial character of his adversary's mind, or alluding to that, has this day skimmed over Scripture almost without touching it, as a spider runs upon water. On the 11th of July, they came to indulgences. It was a mere joke, said Luther. The dispute was ridiculous. The indulgences fell outright, and Eck was nearly of my opinion. Eck himself said, if I had not disputed with Dr. Martin on the papal supremacy, I should almost have agreed with him. The discussion next turned on repentance, absolution of the priest, and satisfactions. Eck, according to his usual practice, quoted the scholastic doctors, the Dominicans, and the Pope's canons. Luther closed the disputation with these words. The reverend doctor flees from the scriptures as the devil from before the cross. As for me, with all due respect to the fathers, I prefer the authority of holy writ, and this test I would recommend to our judges. Here ended the dispute between Eck and Luther. Karl Stott and the Ingolstadt doctor, who is Eck, kept up the discussion two days longer on human merits in good works. Kuiper writes, one result of the Leipzig debate was that Luther greatly strengthened his cause among his followers. He made them feel certain that their position was right. Luther also won many new followers, one of whom was Martin Bucer, who became an important leader of the Reformation and who helped to shape the views of John Calvin. As is usually the case, neither debater was able to change his opponent's views. However, the debate did much to clarify Luther's ideas for himself. This was undoubtedly the most important result. This debate was also an important stage in the Reformation movement. It made it clear to everybody that reconciliation between Luther and the Roman Catholic Church would be impossible. By the way, the, the church in that day was not technically yet Roman Catholic. It wasn't until the uh, Council of Trent where they canonized their, their doctrine that it became such, but essentially it's, it's the same. Now, between Leipzig and the Diet. Uh, Luther completed his break with Rome by denying the supremacy of the Pope and the infallibility of councils. Uh, Eck went to Rome soon after the debate and asked Pope Leo to excommunicate Luther, which he gladly did. Luther, however, continued to write. First, he published an account of the Leipzig debate. Then he began to write many other pamphlets and letters. In May of 1520, he wrote a pamphlet entitled On Good Works, which was an application of the principle of salvation by faith alone to everyday life. Luther also read a couple of books that, that uh, profoundly affected him. One was a work of Huss that had been given to him at the debate by the Hussites, which showed him that Huss taught the same thing that he believed. Luther responded by declaring himself to be a disciple of the Bohemian. Uh, the other book that he wrote was a book written uh, by the Italian humanist Lorenzo Valla, in which Valla proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the document called the Donation of Constantine was a forgery. Uh, Constantine, as you know, was a Roman emperor. He was the one who made Christianity uh, legal. He was also the one who supposedly uh, gave ecclesiastical supremacy over his entire kingdom to the Bishop of Rome. And that was a document which was a forgery and yet it was one used by the popes throughout the centuries to lay claim to this supremacy. So Valla proved that it was a forgery. Luther was so agitated over this discovery that he no longer doubted that the Pope was the Antichrist.
Finally, on June 15, 1520, Pope Leo issued the bull that excommunicated Luther. The bull mentioned 41 propositions with Luther as the author and condemned them as heretical or scandalous or false or offensive to pious ears or seducing to simple minds and standing in the way of the Catholic faith. It called upon all the faithful to burn Luther's books. It forbade him to preach. He and his followers were ordered to recant publicly within 60 days. If they didn't, they were to be treated as heretics. It ordered the government to imprison Luther and his followers. Any town or district that sheltered them would be placed under an interdict, which we saw this morning. It was basically the Pope puts a hold on all the sacraments. Priests can't minister any sacraments. If you die, it's tough luck. You go to hell. So that's something that no town or district wanted. So any that would help Luther would have to suffer. Now the bull was entrusted to Eck to publish it in Germany, which he had a difficult time doing because only a few places would comply. At Erfurt, the students took all the copies of the bull that they could and threw them in the river. Luther replied with a tract of his own entitled against the execrable or abominable bull of Antichrist. Luther continued to write. Because there were no newspapers in those days, the people eagerly bought and read his small books and pamphlets. Luther was gaining a large following, not only in Germany, but far beyond, to further diffuse the papal bull and to raise the standard against Rome. Luther published three more works in the latter part of 1520. The first was entitled to the Christian nobility of Germany, which was a call to secular authority temporarily to oversee reform in the church. The second, um, the second book was called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, where he exposes the claim of Rome that men can only be saved through the priesthood and the Roman system of sacraments, and then The Liberty of a Christian Man, a small work of 30 pages containing the whole sum of the Christian life, which attacked the theology of the Roman church by asserting the priesthood of all believers. Luther believed that writing was not enough. If the Pope ordered Luther's writings to be burned, he would burn the Pope's bull. So on, on December the 10th, 1520, Luther, with a large crowd of students, professors, and citizens, let's see, assembled Luther first burned the books of canon law the church law, then a copy of the bull, and said, As thou hast wasted the Holy One of God, so may the eternal flames waste thee. Luther left when the books and the bull were consumed, but hundreds of students remained, and as the fire was dying, they sang, We praise thee, O God. Then some funeral dirges in honor of the burnt papal decretals and bull. Well, next Luther is summoned by the emperor. Pope Leo had exhausted all of his ecclesiastical means. All he could do now was turn to the emperor, Charles V of Spain. Charles was a devout Catholic, so Leo was successful in having Luther summoned before a council in the city of Worms or Worms. And so we come to what is called the Diet of Worms, April of 1521. Now, though Luther believed or had a, sa a pledge of safe conduct from the emperor, he believed he was going to his death. Before he left, he said to Melanchthon, his colleague and friend at the university, my dear brother, if I do not come back, if my enemies put me to death, you will go on teaching and standing fast in the truth. If you live, my death will matter little. Everywhere Luther traveled, crowds turned out to see the man who dared to stand up against, or for Germany, against the Pope. They too thought he was going to his death. Luther appeared before the Diet at four in the afternoon, Wednesday of April the 17th, and again we turn to Daubigny for the account. Martin Luther, his sacred and invincible imperial majesty has cited you before his throne in accordance with the advice and counsel of the states of the Holy Roman Empire to require you to answer two questions. First, 
Do you acknowledge these books to have been written by you? At the same time, the imperial speaker pointed with his finger to about 20 volumes placed on a table in the middle of the hall, directly in front of Luther. I do not know how they could have procured them, said Luther, relating this circumstance. It was Aleander who had taken this trouble. Secondly, continued the chancellor, are you prepared to retract these books and their contents, or do you persist in the opinions you have advanced in them? Luther replied, most gracious emperor, gracious princes and lords, his imperial majesty has asked me two questions. As to the first, I acknowledge as mine the books that have just been named. I cannot deny them. As to the second, seeing that it is a question which concerns faith and the salvation of souls and in which the word of God, the greatest and most precious treasure either in heaven or earth is interested I should act imprudently were I to reply without reflection. I might affirm less than the circumstance demands or more than truth requires and so sin against this saying of Christ, whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. For this reason I entreat your imperial majesty with all humility to allow me time that I may answer without offending against the word of God. After consideration, the Diet gave him another day to think about it and then to reply vocally and not in writing. Luther prayed that night and the next morning. When he was readmitted to the Diet, he was asked again, Martin Luther, yesterday you begged for a delay that has now expired. Assuredly, it ought not to have been conceded, as every man, especially you, who were so great and learned a doctor in the Holy Scripture, should always be ready to answer any questions touching his faith. Now, therefore, reply to the question put by his majesty, who has behaved to you with so much mildness. Will you defend your books as a whole, or are you ready to disavow some of them? Again, Luther tried to defend his works, but when he was asked again to answer only this one question, will you or will you not retract, he answered, since your most serene majesty and your high mightinesses require from me a clear, simple, and precise answer, I will give you one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, Unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and I will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against conscience. And then looking round on the assembly before which he stood and which held his life in its hands, he said, Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Now, the outcome and the aftermath of the Diet, Luther was ordered to leave the Diet, to return to Wittenberg, and was forbidden to preach. He was declared to be a heretic and was outlawed by the Diet. This meant basically that anyone who found him uh, along the way, wherever he was, could kill him and take all of his possessions, no questions asked. On the road back to Wittenberg, he was abducted by Frederick's men and taken to a castle that is called the Wartburg Castle, where he wrote for 10 months. Basically, as I understand it, uh, Frederick, the elector of Saxony, wanting to protect Luther and wanting also to protect himself, uh, ordered his men to abduct Luther and take him to a place which, uh, well, I should say to um, not tell him uh, where they took him. Uh, so that when he was asked where Luther was, he might honestly respond, he did not know. <laughs> but he did this to protect Luther. He took him to this castle where Luther wrote for 10 months. There's a picture of the Wartburg Castle and the room in which uh, Luther actually wrote. I think it was in this room that um, he uh, had the experience where when he was writing, the devil appeared, at least the way the story goes, and he took his inkwell and threw it at the devil who then disappeared. Now the ink splashed against the wall, but apparently it's all gone because uh, people visiting the castle have chipped away at the area that had the ink. And so it's, it is all 
It's all gone. Okay, but here he completed his translation of the New Testament into German. And then um, uh, this, this was from Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And eventually, after the 10 months, of course, returned to, to Wittenberg to expel Karlstadt and to preach against his rebellion. Karlstadt basically took the reform to an extreme in Luther's opinion. They began to do a lot of destruction. They became somewhat riotous. And so Luther um, basically washed his hands of Karlstadt's activities, expelled him, and preached against these reforms. Now, later reforms and, and final events. Luther does introduce further reforms. He entirely rejected the papacy. And the distinction between the laity and the clergy were discarded. He affirmed only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, instead of the seven of Rome. And he taught that they were not indispensable to salvation. Uh, salvation did not come through the sacraments. It came through faith in Christ. Now, that may sound strange because we do know that Luther believed that those who were baptized were actually saved, and he believed that was true even of children who were baptized, even those who clearly uh, had not made any type of profession of faith. But Luther also believed that God gave them a supernatural gift of faith at their baptism because he, he believed that salvation came by grace through faith alone. So really what's being said here is not contradictory to what Luther believes. Uh, this effectively brought an end to, um, to Rome's tyranny and established Christian liberty. You see, if you don't need the, sa the sacraments in order to be saved, you're no longer tied to uh, the Roman church of mediation and, and mediators. You don't need anything between you and Christ. You can come directly to him. Uh, praying to the saints and to Mary was done away with. The worship of images veneration, of relics, pilgrimages. He also rejected religious processions, holy water. Somebody should tell the uh, Cathedral of St. Paul about that. Uh, outward asceticism as having any value to increasing holiness. Uh, monasticism, which is what he practiced but now denied. Uh, prayers for the dead. Uh, I think he believed at this point you're either in heaven or hell. You cannot really pray for anyone, and that goes along with his rejection of purgatory. He did adopt the idea that things not forbidden in the Bible should be retained. That's why uh, we differ with the Lutheran churches, perhaps, on the environment of worship, uh, what the decor might look like, and maybe some of the things we might do. Um, Side altars and images were removed, but the main altar with candles and a picture of Christ remained. He rejected the sacrificial view of the Lord's Supper. He affirmed that Christ was offered only once for sins. In the Roman Mass, Christ is offered each time it is celebrated, offered again. He believed that the cup should not be withheld from the laity. He believes that all believers should be given the both the bread and the wine. Luther denied transubstantiation, let's see, oh. but um, he continued to affirm that the body and the blood of the Lord are really present in the elements since he believed his body as well as his divine spirit was everywhere. Uh, this, as we'll see in just a moment and only briefly, the, became the point at issue when he tried to join forces with Zwingli uh, in Switzerland. Let's see, he didn't believe, oh, okay, no place in the church for priests. Okay, he believed that the state, he adopted a form of church government where the state is above the church. We call that Erastianism. Uh, basically, it's believed that he did this because of the circumstances that actually helped him reform the church. If it hadn't been for Frederick's help, uh, he would, humanly speaking, not have been able to do what uh, he did. Uh, Reformed theology, um, <clears throat> at least outside of Lutheran circles, believes that the church should, excuse me, the state should protect the church, but she should never intrude into her ordinances. In an Erastian church government, they basically appoint the pastors of the individual churches, though I don't think they would intrude into the sacraments. Uh, Luther also founded many schools, wrote his famous Shorter Catechism, 
so that children might be grounded in evangelical doctrine, wrote a hymn book. His most famous hymn, or including his most famous hymn, which is The Mighty Fortress is Our God. By the way, this picture up here is of a handwritten copy of A Mighty Fortress signed by Martin Luther. Now, Luther did not believe that he was founding a new church. He believed that there was really only one true visible church. The Romanists were the ones who had departed from the truth. He was only reforming the church which had become deformed. Now, his beliefs were eventually formulated by, in an official statement by Philip Melanchthon, who is the one that Luther had full confidence in. He was basically the theologian of the Lutheran movement which were approved by Luther and given to the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. Uh, that's a picture of the Diet in the middle, and that's, again, Charles V. Charles V gave the document to John Eck, his theologian, <clears throat> who wrote a reply. And then Melanchthon wrote a reply to John Eck's rebuttal. And uh, that confession is known as the Augsburg Confession, still widely used in the Lutheran Church today. On June the 13th, 1525, Luther married Catherine von Bora, a uh, former nun, uh, ending a 300-year law of the Roman Church that a priest must never marry. Many other monks and nuns followed his example, and another step was taken away from Rome. Now, the final events in his life. Uh, Luther lost Erasmus' support in 1525 when Erasmus saw that Luther's reforms would lead to a break with Rome. He also, um, uh, well, let's see, <clears throat> excuse me, he disagreed with Luther's view that the will of man was so bound that God must initiate salvation. Erasmus emphasized the freedom of the will in his book by that title, while Luther wrote against him in his famous book called The Bondage of the Will. Um, the Bondage of the Will was basically a rebuttal or a reply to Erasmus, and so that's why the book is structured as it is. He begins by answering Erasmus's positions, sort of uh, proposition by proposition, but then when he sees it's going to take too much time, he, he sort of speeds up a bit. So there's a little bit of discontinuity in the book, but um, uh, basically writing against the prevalent view that man is free to choose um, good or evil on his own power. Even Luther believed that God must initiate, God must exert his power before man can respond. However, Luther also believed that a man could resist and end up not being saved. So even though God may um, use his full power in the preaching of the gospel to draw men to himself, ultimately it's in man's hands whether he's going to receive the Lord or not. Uh, Luther also lost the support of the peasants in 1525 when he opposed what is called the Peasants' Revolt. They had applied Luther's denunciation of, the, of church authority uh, to the state, and it resulted in an uprising. Luther wrote against them when he saw that what they were doing was endangering the Reformation, and as a result, sadly, many of the peasants were killed. In 1529... Um, he met with Zwingli at the what's called the Marburg Colloquy in an attempt by their friends to get them to join uh, forces. Uh, Carnes writes that they agreed on over 14 out of 15 propositions, but disagreed on how Christ was present in the elements. Zwingli contended the communion was a memorial, uh, a memorial of Christ's death, but Luther argued that there was a real physical presence of Christ in the communion although the substance of bread and wine uh, did not change. Uh, if you were here in 2003, uh, you'll know we went into some detail on the Marburg Colloquy. Uh, Luther could not believe that a Christian could deny the real physical presence of Christ in the Lord's table, so he could not believe that Zwingli was a Christian, though Melanchthon believed that he was, and Oitel and Potius, who was um, Zwingli's uh, companion, uh, certainly believed that as well. For some reason, Luther turned his guns on Zwingli, but I think through the efforts of all involved, they finally got Luther to agree that Zwingli was a Christian and he was able to cooperate with him at least at some level. Uh, we do have to be a little bit uh, careful here. 
uh, in, in judging Luther and perhaps his lack of charity uh, because uh, those, as you can see, he went through some pretty difficult times. And you had to stand very firmly on each belief and basically be willing to go to the wall on it. You can see how he might respond then to Zwingli not willing to give up anything. It's that kind of tenacity, that, that kind of commitment to what he perceived to be the truth that made him the, uh, well, the person that he was and the fit uh, instrument through which the Lord would bring about this reformation. So when sometimes, you know, you, I, I've seen the same thing happening to you. You see people who are really committed to a particular cause and they're, they're really in there and they're fighting everything against it and yet you look at them and you wonder, what if these people begin to disagree with one another? What's going to happen? Well, usually what happens is they turn those guns on each other and begin shooting each other with the same kind of, of power and strength that they fight against those particular issues. Uh, we really need to be careful about that, that we don't treat those in the household of faith as we would treat those outside or treat them uh, in any way that's less than charitable. In 1534, the German translation of, this, of the whole Bible was completed and published. In 1537, his health began to decline. And he was burdened by what he perceived to be a resurgency of the papacy. And an attempt by the Jews during the time of confusion among Christians to reopen the question regarding Jesus' messiahship. Uh, believing that he was somewhat responsible for this because he was the one that caused the, um, the uproar among the, the church, the reform in the church, he wrote a violent polemic against the Jews as well as against the papacy. Finally, in the winter of 1546, he went to Mansfeld to resolve a conflict between two young counts. But being old and of poor health, he died February the 18th. Uh, 1546 in the Eisleben at the age of 63. That's a, a picture of his gravestone. Now again, I want us to look at the life of Luther because, of course, this is the Reformation. Uh, when Luther wrote against the indulgences, when Luther was converted himself and began to see the abuses in the church, when he began to seek reform in those things, uh, those are all examples to us of really what we need to have if we're going to advance the kingdom of heaven uh, in, in our age. Um, again, the Lord may not call all of us to be Luther's, at least uh, to do the things that he did. Those circumstances don't exist. We don't have his gifts. Uh, we can't do what Luther did. But we can do something similar in the situations in which the Lord places us if we are equipped uh, to deal with those things. And so I'd like to suggest uh, perhaps in closing maybe three principles that we can take from Luther's life. I think the first one we could take is from the beginning of his Christian experience, as it were, as he was struggling to find forgiveness. I think the first one might, we might say is concern for your eternal well-being. Uh, to make sure that you are a true believer, that your sins have been washed away in the blood of Christ, that you are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and not on any works that you might do. Uh, a second principle might be uh, zeal for the truth. You know, it's truth that secures your eternal well-being. It's truth that God uses to convert. Uh, it's truth that he's given to us in the Word of God. Uh, you'll notice in Luther's life that he was not willing to compromise on anything he perceived to be the truth of God, and that's why he, he blasted uh, Zwingli to the degree that he did, because he was firmly convinced the Word of God said this. Now, I would suggest that we be zealous for the truth, but perhaps, uh, unlike Luther, uh, perhaps be more charitable in, in our disagreements, uh, Discuss it. Reason with one another. Reason with other believers. Try to lead them to the truth. And then thirdly, perhaps um, we can, let's see, uh, draw this principle, intensity of commitment. Was Luther a fanatic? Uh, 
Did he go overboard? Did he do things that uh, he shouldn't have done? Uh, was he too extreme? Is that why he wore himself out the way he did? Is that why he put himself in difficult circumstances where he was in danger of his life? Uh, or was Luther actually giving himself to God's cause in the way that he calls each one of us uh, to do? Well, I would suggest that he is an example to us in all three of these areas that the Lord wants us to have these three things to make sure we're soundly converted, to make sure we're zealous for the truth, and to make sure that we have this kind of commitment to God's cause. Because if we don't, we're not going to be able to do what God calls us to do. Now, what is there for us to do? Uh, it seems like uh, the Reformers have uh, fairly um, extensively criticized the, the church of their day. I think we know what the uh, dangers are to look out for in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, what, what, what is there that we have to face today? Well, I think you understand, of course, that there are people that we could help that are in the Roman church uh, to, to lead them to the truth. So uh, we need to know the truth and have a commitment in order to try to help them. Uh, today, we have a different kind of a situation than what Luther had. Uh, secularism was not quite as pronounced back then as it is today. The idea of you know, atheism and evolutionism um, isn't, wasn't as prevalent back then as it is today. We live uh, post-Darwin and so forth, and uh, the Death of God movement came after uh, Luther, and uh, you know, what's called the so-called Enlightenment, which we would call perhaps the Endarkenment, has taken place between us and Luther. So there are many challenges that we have to face today that Luther didn't have to face, and yet the solution or the way that we have to deal with those are, are pretty much the same way. We need to make sure that we are soundly converted, that we are Christians, that we really do know the Lord. We do need to be zealous for His truth and in Christian love seek to reach out to others. But we're not going to do that unless we have a whole life commitment to the Lord. And again, I would simply point you to Martin Luther as an example of that kind of commitment. I would say that at least looking outwardly at his life. And again, Luther was not perfect. Luther had many flaws. We saw one of them at the uh, Marburg Colloquy as far as the way he treated Zwingli. I, I'm sure that, that he had problems in his, his marriage and his family and in his ministry, and he had flaws like anyone else. But we also see within him an overwhelming desire to honor the Lord because he was acutely aware of what the Lord had delivered him from that he had purchased his soul at the cost of his own blood, and now he belonged to the Lord to do with whatever he would, and he was willing that God do that through him. Uh, we need to have that same kind of desire, that same kind of commitment that uh, Luther had. Again, we'll have it imperfectly as Luther had it, but if we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to honor him, that's what we need to do. So let's let this example Every time I go through the life of Luther, it encourages me uh, in this way. I think every time you read Christian biography, it encourages you in this way because here are people who lived outside of the Bible, as it were, in a certain sense. That This is not a, a, an account written in Scripture. Uh, this is not the perfect life of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we'd expect to be perfect in every way, but this is the life of an imperfect person who was redeemed and who trusted the Lord and who served the Lord this is an example of something that we can do by the grace of God. I, that's why I find uh, you know, biography to be encouraging because these, you know, these are people just like us who simply trusted the Lord and the Lord did great things through them. I'm not saying that God will necessarily do anything great through us, but if he does anything through us at all, it's certainly worth whatever we have to do for the Lord to use us. So let's be encouraged by the example of Luther to seek that kind of life, to be entirely committed to him. Well, does anybody have uh, any questions? Uh, could you get the lights, BJ? Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? <laughs>
Uh, could you speak up just a bit? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Stout pits? Well, I think, I, I do believe that there were converted people within the church. Even though they believed in the priest, you know, the, well, the, the um, well, the, I guess, you know, the priest that ministered the sacraments. And that you needed grace through the sacraments. We, we always have to believe that God had his elect, his converted, even in the worst of circumstances. So there were people who were saved. But whether or not Staupitz was actually saved, we can only conjecture. The thing is, if Staupitz was, he didn't know how he was saved because he wasn't able to lead Luther to, to Christ. Um, you, you would think that if a person had a clear idea of trusting in Jesus, that he might be able to do that. Um, well, they should be able to do that, lead them to Christ. So it, it's possible that maybe Staupitz didn't know how he had found Christ, but that's kind of hard to believe. So I would say we should assume because he couldn't lead Luther to Christ that he himself probably had not found Christ either. Yeah, sure. Oh, Kathy, I'm sorry. Well, that's, um, that's actually a good question. Very few people would have had access. And one of the things that we, um, we saw was that the reformers were trying to get, and even the pre-reformers were trying to get the Bible into the hands of the people. Uh, it had been removed, again, by a layer of, tran uh, not translators, but interpreters. Uh, and the Bible existed in a language that people couldn't, couldn't read. And even the translation that the Roman church insisted on uh, was a faulty translation that Luther could not find Christ in. Uh, I don't know that that would apply to all of Scripture and if it was just because the prevalent view in those days and what they were being taught was contrary to the truth, that probably created some of the problems. But the people who would have had access to what God actually wrote would be only those theologians who were studying the original languages and that's actually how Luther himself found Christ. So um, very, very few people would have had access to it, which is why the pre-reformers or the forerunners and Luther wanted to translate it and to get it into their hands so they could find Christ. Well, I've, I've seen many things that lead me to believe that even the priests perhaps were even as ignorant or maybe just a step above where the people were and were not ministering the truth to them. Great. The priest, you mean, or, yeah, very likely. Yes, Erica. Well, essentially everything that we saw that they rejected, that the reformers rejected, that Luther and the forerunners rejected, that is what the Roman church believes today. They still believe that today. Now, if, if I didn't make this clear, I should make it clear. They do believe that we are saved by grace alone. That's what they say, okay, say they believe. But they don't believe it's by faith alone. And we would say, if it's not by faith alone, it can't be by grace alone. But they believe that we're saved by grace alone. Now, whose grace are we saved by? We're saved by the grace of Christ. You know, he needed to live, he needed to die in order to fill up the treasury of heaven with grace that the Pope could dispense. And then that treasury, it's called the treasury of merits. It can also be dispensed, oh, I should say there, there are other, th other things that are put in it by the saints who actually go directly to heaven. But I think that has to do more with satisfaction than with forgiveness. You, you need Christ in order to be saved, in order to be forgiven. They, they would not believe that Jesus fully satisfied the temporal punishments that are due for your sin, which is why purgatory exists. But they do believe that if you um, receive the sacraments, uh, 
and the grace that's there, your sins will be forgiven, you know, through penance, absolution, and those types of things. They do believe that there is forgiveness through the sacrifice of Christ, but to get that forgiveness, well, you have to initially be baptized to get initial grace. You have to go to a priest to confess your sins. You need uh, to be absolved by the priest. He needs to declare your sins are forgiven, and then he gives you penance to do to, um, to satisfy the temporal punishments uh, for your sins. Uh, so basically, Christ, they do see Christ as being you know, central, but what Christ does in order for it to be applied to you, you've got to go through this system that involves the, the priests and the sacraments. Otherwise, you don't receive forgiveness. So yes, he is a part of it. Now we, we would say, okay, with Luther, uh, we don't need the sacraments, we don't need the priesthood, we don't need to submit to the Pope, we don't need all this stuff, all we need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that makes salvation purely by grace. We just simply receive it. That's what faith is, receiving the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his merits and receiving his atoning death to wash away our sins. It's looking to Jesus Christ away from our works and what they do is they point us to the priests, the sacraments and all this that's going on. So they obscure the gospel by doing that. But so Christ is still important in that system, but not applied as he should be. Yeah. Donna? Part of the mediation, you're, you're basically lighting a candle before a saint in order to get that saint to pray for you. Uh, that saint is in heaven. They believe that if, if, um, if you make this contribution, light this candle, that this saint is going to pray for you in heaven and that's going to help you spiritually on earth. So it is another kind of mediation. You know, they, they put all these different mediators between you and Christ, the saints and their prayers, Mary and her prayers and her approaching Christ, the priests that are on earth and, and the sacraments they dispense. They see all of that as, as necessary. And you can, I suppose, even, I, I think you can, uh, what was it? I'm trying to think of the term now. You, you, you can pay for something, <coughs> burn candles and incense, you can, do special rites, there, there's, there's something you can pay for or buy. You can, you can actually benefit the people who are in purgatory right now, not just yourself. So, so some of these things might be being done for a loved one who's died in the Catholic Church, who's now suffering in purgatory. And you can, you know, you, you may not be able to buy a plenary indulgence from Tetzel and get them straight out, but uh, you, can, you can still do other things that will lessen their time. So all of these things are meant to get you and those in purgatory eventually to heaven. You know, I, I believe that is the case. I think there's like a saint of lost causes and a saint of lost things and a saint who protects you. I think that it has come down to that kind of specialization. Well, I, you know, I, I, we would have to assume that, that he does. If, if that is the belief that existed then, the, the, the teaching of Rome really can't change because um, if, if a pope says something is true, it must be true, it must be infallible. And even though popes contradict one another and even though they believe in the infallibility of councils, uh, they still hold on to that belief even though they contradict one another. So it, it might be possible that someone along the line, and I don't know for sure, may have said something that indicates that that isn't true, but the belief was certainly prevalent in, in Luther's day. I mean, the Pope was dispensing uh, the excess merits of the saints and the excess merits of Christ through indulgences. If that Pope could do it, I guess the real question is, is whether or not 
what Tetzel was saying really reflected what the Pope actually thought or what the church thought. Um, I, I don't, I, I imagine Luther would have known and Luther was not writing just against what Tetzel was saying, but was probably writing against what the church actually believed. I wonder if in, <coughs> in, the ca in that case, I mean, the Pope he confers sainthood on certain saints that, that he believes have gone directly to heaven. I'm not sure whether his pronouncement makes it true or if he just has an infallible discernment as to who actually did. But again, as per Martin Luther, he could make them all saints by emptying purgatory and letting them all come. Why doesn't he do that? So that's why, uh, again, Luther was challenging indulgences. He didn't believe that the Pope had such authority, I think. Yeah. Christ does, though. So if you, if you want to go directly to heaven, you have to trust in Jesus Christ. By the way, if anyone here hasn't trusted the Lord, if you die and you wake up in a fiery place, it isn't purgatory. I, I, I've wondered sometimes whether uh, maybe those who are, you know, um, who believed in purgatory and died, you know, if, if the realization of where they are is immediately there, if they might think that they're in purgatory because the description of purgatory is very much like hell. It's, it's a fiery place where you suffer, sometimes for millions or even billions of years before you go to heaven to satisfy for the temporal punishment that is due to you for your sins you committed in this world. Luther would say that not only the guilt is forgiven, but also the the satisfaction for your temporal punishment has also been paid for by Christ. So once you die, that's it. Now there may be consequences in this life if one of the sins you've committed is you've hurt somebody else, you've broken the law, you're still gonna have to pay for that. Christ didn't pay for that. If you murdered, I mean, in the sense that he didn't pay for that temporal punishment while you're in this world, if you commit murder and then you ask Christ for forgiveness, it doesn't mean you're not gonna be put on trial for murder, but it does mean that, that once you die, you still go directly to heaven. You don't have to pay anything after that. Any other um, questions or, or comments? Oh, Dick. Yeah, you know, over the years, theology has become so complicated. I mean, I think we'd all agree it's, it's complicated that the, uh, the Roman Church came up with a doctrine that's called implicit faith. And the idea is that in order to be a faithful Christian, you don't have to know what the Bible teaches. You only have to believe that your priest is teaching you what the Bible actually says. You, all you have to do is trust what he's saying. That's called implicit faith. And God will accept that. Are there many Catholics who don't know what the church teaches? There's lots of them because they're just trusting their priest. But again, the reformers would say, here's the Bible, read the Bible, <laughs> learn it for yourself, judge all things by Scripture, don't accept anything except that which is grounded in Scripture. And that's why we have the Bible. That's why the Lord gave us his word. Yeah, that was a lot. Jerry? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that they have a, a translation that they favor, but I, I, don't, I don't doubt that, you know, uh, well, Roman Catholics can, of course, purchase any Bible and read, read any Bible. They can read the Bible in the language today. Uh, that's something they couldn't do back then. People would actually be, be put to death if they, if they had a translation of the Bible in, in, in their language back in those days, but... Uh, there's been a change, one of those contradictions where maybe when they saw that they couldn't keep 
Christians or, or people within in the church from reading it, they finally said, okay, it's okay. Now, you, you, go, you can go ahead and read it now, whereas they used to put people to death for doing that. Um, by the way, we, we shouldn't assume that, that, of course, even those in leadership in the Roman church today necessarily agree with what their forefathers did way back then. So we don't want to impute that kind of you know, attitude to them. But they still have to deal with these beliefs because in, the, in Roman Catholic theology, beliefs, they don't change because they've been given through an infallible interpreter of the Scripture. They cannot backpedal and say, well, we said this, but that isn't right. Um, so they have to find some other way around that. And I understand their theologians are constantly at work trying to get everything that's been said by different popes and councils and so forth to agree. And it's only the popes and the councils that are infallible. Um, so they do, have, uh, they do have that kind of problem, yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments? Angela? Sure. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That I, I, had, I had forgotten about that. <clears throat> Those are the books that were actually written between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New, which are called the Apocrypha. Um, as a matter of fact, the 1611 edition of the King James Version of the Bible actually contains the Apocrypha, which is interesting. But Protestants have actually never accepted them as, as inspired scripture. As a matter of fact, the church in Luther's day had not actually accepted those books as scripture. It wasn't until the Council of Trent, which met, I believe it's in the 1560s, where they included those books. And once they did, and again, this is a difference between Rome and Protestantism, uh, Protestants believe that we simply recognize what is the Word of God and we accept it and receive it as such. Uh, the, the Old Testament church received the books of the Old Testament, and so we received those books. There was a rather um, a lengthy process of um, determining which books of the New Testament actually belonged there. Again, the church didn't say, you know, didn't say, well, this book belongs there, therefore it's the word of God. But they would say, well, this book exhibits these characteristics. This author may quote from it and so forth from another book. Uh, Christ may have, have said something about it. You know, there's just different ways in which they discovered, uh, especially when they saw its light and power. They, they recognized it as the word of God and received it as such. The Roman Church, on the other hand, believes that it is the word of God because they declare it to be the word of God. It's kind of like, does, does a saint go to heaven because the Pope declares him to be a saint? Well, that isn't really a good example because in this case, if the church declares this particular book to be uh, scripture, it becomes scripture. Again, Protestants recognize it. The Roman Catholic Church actually declares it and makes it so, as I understand it. So that's a big difference. Uh, and that's the reason why the Apocrypha can suddenly become a part of the Bible. They declare it to be so, and the reason why is because there were things in the Apocrypha that actually supported doctrines that the Reformers denied. There was no basis in Scripture for it, so we take these books that have these doctrines in it, we make them Scripture, and now we've got scriptural basis for our beliefs. Dick? I don't, um, you know, there's, there's a debate as to exactly where Luther fell out at the end on, on that, but his problem was, again, in recognizing that the book could be the word of God because in his estimation it was teaching salvation by works. So he just misunderstood the book and he struggled with it, but I, I think, as I understand it, in his New Testament, in his whole Bible, I believe the book of James is in there. So I don't think he ultimately rejected it altogether, but he was struggling with what James had to say. It is, as a matter of fact, James that the Roman church points to and says, here, you see, we're, it, we're man's not justified by faith alone. He's justified by faith and works, right? But we know that James isn't talking about the justification by which we stand before God, but he's talking about are we justified in saying that we have genuine faith if it hasn't changed our lives. So we understand that it doesn't contradict Paul, but so 
I think that was Luther's problem. Rome kept insisting that we got to get James in here. This is what James means. And he struggled with it. Before Luther? Oh, well, yeah, yeah for quite some time. Yeah, that, well, that's probably what created the difficulty. <laughs> Was that um, it has been received by the church, and yet it seems to be teaching something that Rome teaches, and I know it's not true because of what Paul says. I don't know, have you ever had that experience um, when, uh, well, a couple of times in my own experience, reading James, what does James mean? Seems to be contradicting Paul. I mean, I've had that same thing, or reading First John, no one who is born of God sins. I mean, if you read the King James on, no one who is born of God sins. Well, but I sin, so I can't be born of God. And so, eh, well, that's not really a problem with the book as much as it is with me. But uh, James, I think we probably, uh, you know, when we, when we become aware of the fact that, that James seems to be contradicting Paul, we, we all have had that struggle. But Luther had it on a grander scale uh, than we did. Uh, Brian? Yeah, yeah, he did. He said, um, Jesus says, this is my body. Jesus said, this is my blood. As a matter of fact, you, you probably uh, heard the, um, well, when we went through Luther and we, we, we kind of went through it in more detail, at, at the Marburg Colloquy when <laughs> Zwingli was trying to convince Luther, it's, it's, it's just a memorial, it's just a memorial. Luther was banging the table and he was saying, Christ says, this is my body, this is my blood. He couldn't have said it any plainer. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you're going to have life in you. Well, how can you do that? Well, it's got to be here. So that's why he believed that. He took the words of Scripture literally where we don't believe that that's how it's intended. He meant physical, physically. Now, he did, as, as we already saw, he did reject transubstantiation, the idea that the, that the substance, again, this, this is a philosophical distinction between substance, what something is really made of, and accidents, or the way in which it, it reveals itself to our senses. Um, bread and wine is, has the substance of bread and wine, and outwardly it appears to us as bread and wine, and it smells like bread and wine, and it tastes like bread and wine, feels like bread and wine, and so forth. Okay. Now, in the Roman church, they believe the substance is changed in the miracle of the Mass and that Christ's body and blood, uh, that, that the substance actually becomes his body and blood, but the accidents or the way in which it reveals itself to our senses remains the same, and that's the miracle. You know, I've, this still looks like wine, smells like wine, tastes like wine, but it's really blood. And the bread still looks, tastes, smells, but it's really his body. Now, Luther said, that's absurd. It's still bread and wine. Obviously, it hasn't changed. And yet, he says that because of what Christ says, somehow Christ adds his substance to it. So it doesn't change. The Lord just simply adds it. And I think in Lutheran churches today, as Donna has experienced when she and her brother went to a Lutheran church in Wisconsin, that unless you believe that, you can't come to the table. You have to believe it's really there. Which I would say is kind of interesting. Why does it matter whether you believe it or not if you're going to get it anyway, at least from their perspective, but they believe you need to believe that. I mean, if somebody came in here, let's say, and they joined with the church and they said, uh, well, I believe it's just a memorial. It's not really, you know, Christ isn't spiritually present to bless and so forth. Would we say, you can't come? You know, because you don't believe the way we believe on this? As long as they don't believe something weird like, you know, transubstantiation, I suppose. <laughs> anyway. we, we would definitely deny that because that is idolatry. If we had somebody come into church and begin worshiping the communion, uh, that would be problematic. Uh, we'd have to try to instruct them and get them to repent because that's idolatry. Okay. So any other uh, questions or comments? Well, not, not that they were the elect, but that they were the church. And as over against that, um, 
the forerunners of the Reformation as well as Luther believe that, well actually I don't know if Luther would believe this or not because he, he believes, Luther believed that a person could not resist the gospel when, when the gospel is preached and God exerts his full power uh, to bring you to himself, that a person could not resist and be saved, but then later could resist and not be saved, and then later could not resist again and be saved, and then resist again and be saved. But Luther, Luther believed, too, that the elect would, would be saved, they would not resist, and that they would be in that state when they died. And that the non-elect, though they could be saved, would certainly fall out of that situation before they died. Yes, well, he did for the elect. He believed it for the elect, but not for everybody who might believe. So if that's the case, you could have people believing who, who technically would be a part of the church at that time. And it gets a little bit complicated. But uh, they could technically be a part of the church, but they wouldn't be elect. So in his view, the church would probably be more expansive than just the elect. But in the view of the others, they, they wanted to, what they wanted to do was say that people, those who are trusting Christ, those who are, are true believers, they are the church, not the pope and the bishops and the cardinals and so forth. I don't know actually what um, Rome sought to gain by that particular doctrine. Does anybody, anybody know? I just know that they held it. I'm not sure exactly why in that particular case. Any other um, questions or comments? <laughs>